Hey friends, how are y'all doing today? Well, our average last frost date has been passed for about two weeks now, and I've checked the weather forecast. It looks great. So I feel safe coming out of the garden and getting some plants in the ground. And so today, while I get some tomatoes planted in the ground, plant some onions, things like that, I wanted to go over a topic with y'all that was brought up by Liz Zarab over at By Their Farms. If you have not checked her out on YouTube, go do it. But she did a video about her 10 vegetables that she must have in her garden and invited other content creators to make the same video and we're all sharing them so you can go through them and find out what vegetables you absolutely need to grow in your garden. So if you're new around here, you may not know that my family is an off-grid family. We focus on being as self-sufficient as possible. So when I look at planting my garden and what I have to have, it comes from a self-sufficiency standpoint. So when I plan out what I'm planting, when I plan out how much of something I'm planting is, I'm going to give priority to the items that will grow more, that will be easy to save seeds from and reproduce, Luckily for us here in South Carolina, we have a very long garden season. I am in zone eight, but our winter is very short. It's like two months. So technically, if I had something like a hoop house or a greenhouse, which I'm hoping to put in this year, I could grow year round with no problems. Our spring comes early and it gets hot fast. Our average last frost date is April 12th. We are now at April 24th and we're already reaching temperatures that are in the high 80s. But let's get into it. Let me share with you what I got going on. So number one on this list, and remember not in any specific order, but it is going to be pole beans. Pole beans specifically, not bush beans. So pole beans will grow tall. You need a trellis for them. Um, some people think of this as the three sisters method. You hear of people trellising their beans across corn. That is a method you can use. Uh, we're going to use cattle panels to trellis all of our stuff this year. I will do pole beans on an arch trellis and on just a cattle panel that goes long ways and see which way they will grow better out here this year. But pole beans will grow and grow and grow and most people can harvest them several times and they put off a lot. Another thing that is fantastic about pole beans is you can eat them fresh, depending on your variety. You can dry them for dried beans that you put up, again, depending on your variety. And they're so easy to save the seeds from. For beans, you want to save the seeds by letting the pods dry and then taking the seeds out of them and letting the seeds dry out completely and that's it. You have your seeds saved and ready to go for the next garden year. Pole beans, being a bean, is fantastic for food storage. If you can get them all the way dry, they will last for many, many years to come. They are good for nutrition wise. They are all together a fantastic thing that you need to have planted in your garden. So next on our list is going to be peas. Now, I want trellising peas, not necessarily bush peas, because I want to encourage them to grow up to not have diseases from being too close together and stuff. I want to trellis them so they get good airflow and they can produce more for me. Now, peas are very similar to beans in the aspect that you can either have peas that are fresh eating snap peas, you can have peas that you shell, you can dry peas. Peas are fantastic to feed to things like ducks. I mean, so peas have many, many uses and they will grow fast. They will produce a pretty good amount of peas per plant. And now you're probably noticing a trend if you've already seen my bees and now you see my peas as I am looking for things that I can plant one of and get multiples back from that plant. And so peas definitely make the list. But while you're speaking of things that will actually produce a ton, you have to mention okra. If you're from the south, you probably know about okra. Okra is delicious. I prefer it fried. You can also pickle okra. You can just saute okra. I throw it in soups and stews. It's great in a vegetable soup, uh, especially a hearty vegetable soup. Um, I grew up eating it that way. Okra is really, really good for your digestive system. A lot of people don't like it because they think it's slimy, and if you cook it wrong, it will be slimy. 
but it's because okra has like a mucusy coating on the inside that will actually help coat your intestines and keep things like high acid foods and stuff from messing with your intestines. It's really good for you. But even better than that, okra is extremely high producing. Probably one of the most high producing plants I will have in my garden this year. Okra, you can pick it often, you can pick it early, and it's one of those, the more you pick, the more it's gonna grow and it will continue to grow and grow and grow. You wanna pick them while they're small so they don't get very hard and woody. If you let them grow too long, it's okay. Go ahead and let them grow as big as they're gonna get and start drying out and then take that one for seeds. Okra seeds are super, super easy. You just let it dry out and you can open the okra and the seeds are right inside of it. It's like ready to go. It's like, hey, here I am, replant me. Okra, like I said, is very high producing to the point that it, most gardeners don't even know what to do with it, so they just let it grow wild, whatever. Okra is another one of those that the leaves are good to feed to animals. You can feed the actual okra plants to animals too. You can feed them to things like pigs and stuff, but the leaves are really good for things like rabbits. So that plant in itself is very multi-purpose. Now we're gonna trellis our okra because a lot of times the okras will get so overburdened that they can start to droop a little. And so I will have them on trellises to kind of keep them straight and help support the weight of that fruit that the okra is producing. And while we're speaking of things that usually produce so much that gardeners are like, I'm done with it, I'm over it. We've got to talk about squash and specifically summer squash. And this is gonna include your yellow summer squash and your zucchinis. Those will produce a ton of food per plant. So they obviously have to make it on our list. Now, yellow squash and zucchini can cross, so you want to plant them separately and plant them a few weeks apart to give one a head start on go ahead and pollinating itself so that you're not crossing your squash um, species. Now squash is another one you can feed to your animals and a lot of people will grow extra squash plants to offset costs for pigs and stuff like that because you can just take squash off the plants and throw them to your pigs, your chickens, they're great. Squash plant leaves are also good for your rabbits. Again, feeding your rabbits from your garden. These plants are very multi-purpose. And next on our list would be our winter squash. Since we're already talking about squash, let's go ahead and cover winter squash. I absolutely, absolutely want winter squash on your list because winter squash is something you can grow in the summer and put up for the winter. That's why it's called winter squash. It grows in the summer, it don't grow in the winter, but it stores for the winter and you can cook from it all winter long. These are gonna be things like your acorn squash, your butternut squash, your pumpkins, things like that. You grow them in the summer, you pick them at the end of summer, fallish, and then you store them for your winter usage. So when you're looking at being a self-sufficient homestead, you need to be able to feed your family year round and a lot of these will not store for year round use. So you need to include some in your garden that you will grow specifically for that winter use and winter squash why it's named that is one of those items. Next on the list are actually things that I've already been planting this morning if you see the dirty hands and that is tomatoes. I don't know any gardener that doesn't grow tomatoes. Tomatoes were actually one of the first plants I ever grew that was a vegetable. I grew them in five gallon buckets and they did fantastic. This year I'm trying a new little garden hack to even better my tomato plant. And I'm gonna share that with y'all in Friday's video, so make sure you are stay tuned for that. But it's, it's fantastic. I have high hopes for this, even increasing the yield of my tomato plants, considering I'm planting in shallow raised beds this morning. It's just gonna, it's gonna be awesome. I'm just saying, just make sure you watch that video. But tomatoes in themselves, I am not a big tomato eater. I will eat tomatoes on my burgers. I will eat them chopped up in my salad and that's about it. So why are tomatoes on my list? Well, that's because you can do so many other things with tomatoes. Sun-dried tomatoes are fantastic and they will store very well. You can also can tomatoes, which is what I will be doing with almost every tomato that grows in this garden. I will can them up as tomato sauce, as salsa, pasta sauce, as pizza sauce, as just diced tomatoes. I will literally be storing tomatoes in a ton of different ways for use year round. 
That goes back with our winter squash item. So a winter squash, we grow it in the summer to use in the winter. Tomatoes are very similar. So I'm growing them in the summer and I will start putting them up and canning them for winter, spring use, stuff like that. So tomatoes absolutely have to be on the list. Now, another fantastic thing about tomatoes is tomatoes are a high acid food. What that means is you can water bath can tomatoes. You do not need a pressure canner for tomatoes. So if you are just getting started on canning, but you still wanna preserve food for your family, tomatoes are a great way to go. You can do so much with preserving your tomatoes just using a water bath canner. And all a water bath canner is, is a big stock pot. So you don't even have to buy a fancy water bath canner. If you've got a large stock pot, all you need is something for your jars to set on so that they're not bouncing on the bottom. People will use old t-shirts, so use rags. You can buy just a canning rack that will fit in your stock pot, different things like that. But a stock pot will work and you can start canning food for your family right away, learning with a water bath canner. That's how I learned. It is fantastic. It is a fantastic way to go. And so it makes tomatoes a must have in your garden. Now my next variety I think goes hand in hand with tomatoes in growing. I always will grow them side by side. So with my trellises, tomatoes will be on one side and then my peppers will be on the other. And so peppers are definitely on my list. Last year, our pepper plants outproduced everything else I planted. Like they produced and produced and produced, especially our banana pepper plants. Oh my goodness, I had banana peppers coming out of my ears. It was crazy and I loved it. Oh, peppers are so easy to grow. They grow really, really well. They are so easy to save seeds from. You just let them get fully mature and then the seeds are right there on the inside for you to take and dry and save and put up for your next planting season. Now, peppers for storage wise, a lot of times I will chop them and freeze them or I will make pepper jelly out of my peppers. I love pepper jelly. I put it on things like pickled eggs, on top of my beans when I make like beans and rice or ham and beans or something like that. It's like a sweet, spicy jelly and it is so good. It is just so good. And if you're doing a party, pepper jelly is the way to go. All you need is a block of cream cheese that you set out, let it get soft, pour the pepper jelly right on top and do some like crackers on the plate with it or some little chunks of toasted bread, toastinis, whatever you wanna call them and have people dip it into that. It is, y'all, I will sit there and eat the whole plate. It is that good. Love pepper jelly. Pepper jelly is again, another thing you can watch your bath can. You don't have to have a pressure canner to do it. And all it is is a little bit of peppers, some sugar and some gelatin. I can't remember what else. I need to finish my coffee. But I have a video on it. I will put it down below. Confetti pepper jelly is what we call it. It is so good and you definitely have to try it. Okay, next on our list is cucumbers. Now, these kind of are similar to your summer squash. They look a lot like zucchini. They are one plant that will produce a lot, a lot, a lot. They're also very easy to put up and store in things like pickles. You can ferment pickles, you can water bath can pickles. They are fantastic. We make a ton, a ton of pickles, put them up and eat them all throughout the year. Whatever you wanna do with them. Cucumbers are fantastic and another thing I will absolutely have growing in my garden. Okay, next to last is corn. Corn, corn, corn. If you are not in a place that is hot enough to grow corn, I am so sorry. Because corn is easy to store. So you grow your corn up. You can eat it fresh, which I absolutely love corn that has been like on the grill or even boiled corn. I am not picky. I love corn. But you can also dry it, grind it for cornmeal, grind it for grits. You can just dry it and make popping corn. You can easily dry it for your seeds for the next year. Like corn is super, super easy. And it is a great companion planting for pole beans, which we've already listed on this list, and for squash, which we have also listed on this list. So grow you some corn. Okay, so last but certainly not least is probably one of my favorite 
plants that I have got planted in the garden already this year and that is going to be potatoes. Yes, potatoes guys. They're so good no matter where you're from, no matter what you call them. Potatoes, tatoes, taters, I don't care, spuds. They're good and they are a friend to the gardener. Now I am lumping both white potatoes like your regular potatoes, your um, Idaho potatoes, your russet potatoes, your yellow spud, whatever you want to call them. That's one group and then sweet potatoes is the other group. I've just mixed them all together for the sake of this list. Maybe that's cheating a little bit but shh, don't tell anybody. One potato or one sweet potato will make many different planting pieces. So whether it slips or pieces that you've cut your potato up into, one potato will make a ton of pieces to plant throughout your garden and then each piece will grow a bunch of potatoes. So that's why potatoes are fantastic. They grow easy, they're easy to replant. There's no like guesswork with seed saving or anything like that. If your white potato has eyes and has started to sprout, grow it. If your sweet potato is stuck in dirt or water and has started to sprout, grow those slips. You've got more potatoes. Yes, love potatoes. So maybe I do have a number one plant in my garden. And if you can tell from my excitement, it would have to be potatoes. I just love them and I can't help it. I've always been a huge fan of them, no matter which way you cook them. So now I wanna hear your feedback. Let me know down below if you agree with my top 10 vegetable list or not. If there's anything you would take away from this list or anything you would add to it. I want to know specifically what vegetables you can plant one of and get a lot of that grow easily, that reproduce easily, or you can save seeds from easily, or that put up in store easily. When we're looking at self-sufficiency, these are all topics we have to consider. And so if you have a vegetable that I need to include on my list, please let me know in the comments down below. I will also link below all the videos that I mentioned throughout this video. So check the description box for those. All right, friends, I will see y'all next time. Bye now.